ready? Do we have speed? We got speed everywhere. We're speeding? Yeah, Do I need to clap maybe, or anything? Hey, Booktubers, this is Barack Obama. As some of you may know, I wrote a book about my political life, my campaign, and first part of my presidency called A Promised Land. We've got some people that have some questions for me and, and have some thoughts about how it relates to their own lives. So let's get started. Hello, President Obama. My name is Mark Rober. I am a former NASA and Apple mechanical engineer, and now I make monthly YouTube videos, ranging anywhere from an automatic bullseye dartboard to a rocket power golf club, which does wonders for your long game, by the way. I'd be super happy to lend it to you. And off the top, I just want to mention that most of my nine years at NASA were during your administration. In fact, I spent seven years working on the Curiosity rover, and I remember when you called us from Air Force One to congratulate us on the successful landing. In your book, you talk about your fascination with space as a kid, and I can't imagine what it must have been like when you were eight years old during the moon landing, witnessing the first time a fellow human being left behind a footprint on something other than our planet. And I know so much of what I love about teaching science to the young folk is watching their world open up and encouraging them to think big. So I'm curious to hear about young Barack Obama's eight-year-old fascination with space and how that impacted you when you became President Barack Obama. Hey, Mark. First of all, I really want that rocket-powered golf club, that driver, because uh, my drives have been a little bit short although Secret Service may want to investigate how safe it is. So that's point number one. Point number two, thanks for your service at NASA. That rover was spectacular. It's great that you are part of it. I write about in the book, I lived in Hawaii till I was six years old, and the Apollo program was going on then. And the capsules would land in the middle Pacific and then get brought into Hawaii. And we were part of a crowd that was there to greet them. Me sitting on my grandfather's shoulders, waving a little American flag as one of the capsules were recovered and the astronauts you could see through the portal waving. You know, that's, it's one of my favorite memories of my childhood because it uh, sparked in me that sense of anything being possible. That was part of my idea of America. When I was president, I had the chance to take Malia and Sasha to Cape Canaveral to see one of the launches of a space shuttle there. And to see my daughters listen to this woman who herself was one of the pioneers back in the 60s, wouldn't have had a chance to be an astronaut who was now in charge of the launch. It, it, was a matter of coming full circle and, and reminding me and them uh, of, uh, of what I think is best in this country. When we pull together, when we unify, when we're pulling talents from all different kinds of uh, people, from all different walks of life, it's that optimism that uh, I think drove me even through some pretty difficult times during the presidency. I can trace my passion for science and creativity back to when I was just six years old. I remember my mom asking me to help prepare dinner by cutting some onions, and I went outside and grabbed our swim goggles to keep me from crying. And I just remember her laughing and getting out the camera and just making such a big deal about me trying to come up with a creative solution to this really common problem. And that moment made such an impression on me, and it just really motivated me to want to continue coming up with even more ideas. And as mentioned in your book, as president, you hosted the White House Science Fair. Seeing you engaged with those kids, fostering their interest in science and innovation, reminded me of that moment with my mom. You were the first president to institute the White House Science Fair. What was it about that symbolic gesture that was so important to you? Those science fairs, I loved. 
we got the idea because there was a long tradition of bringing championship athletic teams to the White House, and that's great. But you know, if all we're doing is celebrating athletes and we're not celebrating the amazing work that scientists and engineers and innovators are doing, then you know, kids aren't going to see that for them to get passionate about. So we said, you know, let's let's uh, let's host a science fair. We'd have kids who weren't expected to be fascinated or engaged in science. Girls who so often were uh, finding themselves discouraged from pursuing, you know, STEM and math and science. Suddenly, they had a form where they could see that uh, there's no one way that a scientist or an engineer has to look, that anybody can do it. And, and just some of the stuff was cool. When you were showing that little clip, a guy shot a, a marshmallow. <laughs> this is great. That was one of my favorite moments uh, in the White House. Oh, let's go look at the marshmallow, see what happens. <laughs> I think there may still be like a marshmallow mark somewhere on the wall in the, uh, the state room. But that's okay, it was worth it. My name is LaGuardia Cross, and this is where my journey began. As a new father, my wife and I both not really being sure how everything was going to play out. But it's something we both wanted to start, and I had to document it because I knew it was going to be funny. Girls, do you understand who's looking at us right now? Barack Obama. <laughs> And what? What's Barack Obama? You don't know who Barack Obama is? No. What's Barack Obama? Not Rock. No, <laughs> I'm not gonna let them act like they haven't heard about you before. That's. No, I, I have proof. Who is this? Your cousin, uncle. Okay, but for real. Something that caught me was the promise that you made to yourself after Malia was born. That my kids would know me. That they grew up knowing my love for them feeling that I had always put them first. The same way that you capture life in a book is uh, what I've really been trying to do with my life with them on YouTube. And so since I'm only six years in, father to father, uh, what do I do to prepare for them uh, when they're teenagers? Like, I, I need all the help, and I'm willing to receive any notes. Because whatever I do, I can say this is what Obama told me to do, and they, they should be able to respect that. LaGuardia, let me first of all just say, you are in trouble, brother. Because if you've got two daughters who are already that cute, you are putty in their hands. They're already smarter than you, uh, and they're already thinking about how uh, they are going to play their dad. But I'll offer a, a, a few pieces of advice. First and foremost, uh, treat your wife right because they're going to be watching how you treat your wife. And if you treat her with love and respect, that's what they will expect when they're teenagers. They'll know not to be treated any differently than that. Point number two, your daughters are going to have different temperaments. They may end up at some point shutting the door uh, and only speaking in uh, uh, one syllable over dinner, and you can't take it personally. That's very hard to do because, you know, you're used to them cuddling you and loving you and all that, and then suddenly, sometimes, if they're not talking to you, uh, you feel hurt and spurned. <laughs> but they come out of it. Of course, it may take five years before they come out of it, but they do eventually come out of it. All right, I hope those tips help. Next. Amala ran for president of the world. And the moon. This one right here is... <laughs> Can we go back, back, feel? They actually have a question for you that I'm gonna let them ask right now. <laughs> Mr. Obama, what does it take to be a good leader? The most important thing uh, about being a good leader is treat everybody with kindness and respect and to listen to people. People want to be heard. And if people feel you're hearing them and you care about their ideas, they're more likely to want to work with you uh, and be your teammate.
And you know, a lot of being a good leader really is just uh, figuring out uh, how you can get a team to work together. It's hard to do great things just by yourself. It's uh, better when you're working with others. That makes sense? Hope so. All right. Mr. President, my name is Marquez Brownlee. I run a YouTube channel called MKBHD. And that's where I get to be a huge nerd, basically. I talk all kinds of tech products, review tech. I started my YouTube channel in 2009, so a year after your inauguration, which I was at, by the way. And uh, I also happen to be a professional Ultimate Frisbee player, an avid golfer, and a pretty big NBA basketball fan. A lot of the worlds that I run in haven't been incredibly diverse. Right? I mentioned golf, Ultimate Frisbee, technology. And what I can say is at a, at a youth level, and I think at a lot of the beginner levels, these spaces are more diverse than ever, which is awesome. But you'll notice at a high level, Ultimate Frisbee, golf, technology, not very diverse. And I feel like that makes the spotlight just a little bit hotter as a black man moving through these spaces. So from your book, it's clear that you've felt that spotlight over time as well. So that got me super curious. Just how did that make you feel? Thanks, Marquez. Unbelievable hops uh, on that clip of you in, in uh, Ultimate Frisbee. You're absolutely right. I, I, I write about the fact that there were occasions where I would have to deal with expectations or stereotypes or attitudes that perhaps uh, if I had been white, uh, I would not have had to deal with. Not just me, but a lot of the African Americans or Hispanics, Asian Americans, or in some cases women, were the first in their positions in my administration. All of them had to navigate spaces where traditionally there hadn't been a lot of folks who looked like them in those situations. And it is a extra burden. Uh, but my attitude always was that it was also a privilege to be in these environments where you can actually help these spaces where you're one of the first um, to, to do better and build a better culture. All right. Hello, President Obama. I am Denise. And I'm her wife, Ebony. This is our family, yeah, really. and we are Team Two Moms. <laughs> Mr. President, it's very important to us to show diversity and representation on social media. It's important to us for the LGBTQ plus community to know that having a family is very possible. Mm -hmm. In 2012, you were the first sitting president to publicly, outwardly support same-sex marriage. And there was so much at stake for you politically, but you still did it, and damn, did that feel good. My question to you is, were you afraid? And despite all that was at risk, what made you still do it? Well, Denise and Ebony, uh... It, it is so good to hear from you guys. And uh, I have to say though, watching you with uh, those three gorgeous kids, it brought flashbacks of when our kids were that old and it looked kind of exhausting, uh, even though they were looked pretty well behaved. So uh, kudos to you for keeping up with them. And, and, and thanks for the, for the kind words. Uh, look, I, I'll be honest with you, when I made the announcement of my support for same-sex marriage, I, I didn't feel at that point that um, it was uh, somehow politically dangerous to me. If anything, uh, in retrospect, I probably should have announced my support for same-sex marriage earlier. And I always give credit to those folks in the LGBTQ plus community who raised awareness just saying, this is who I am and uh, I'm not gonna hide it and I'm, uh, I wanna be accepted uh, as a full-fledged member of the American community. That's really what changed attitudes. It's an example of the power of ordinary people when they let their voices be heard and they're living out their values. That changes culture. That's why uh, I'm such a believer in kind of grassroots, small d democracy. Usually change comes from the bottom up. Yeah, I really think that uh, this is more a reflection of, of your courage and, 
and couples like you um, uh, that compelled not just me, but the country to really ask themselves, what are you about? What do you believe in? Kudos to you for that too. As a team of two moms, we were really touched reading about the important role women have played throughout the book. From you talking about your mother, your grandmother, Michelle, and your mother-in-law. We have three kids, and we're striving to be the best role models for all of our kids. Can you speak to the importance female role models have played and still play in your life? Well, that, I could go on forever when it comes to, to female role models because the two people who initially were most influential in my life were my mom and my grandmother. My mother was basically a single mom, but she was the constant in my life and my sister's life. My grandmother ended up working her way up to being vice president of a bank and really was sort of the foundation stone for our family. I do think that I was lucky to have some really strong female figures early on in my life who I saw uh, were professionals and earning their own money and not letting their lives be determined by what the men in their lives were telling them they should be or they should do. You know, there's something, by the way, about being a parent now, having raised two girls, that I would be infuriated if anybody told me that there was something Malia and Sasha could or could not do. I'm doing everything I can to create a world in which not just my daughters, but anybody's daughters uh, are, uh, you know, experiencing the freedom and opportunity that uh, we afford our boys and our men. We're not, we're not gonna hold girls back. We can't afford to. Hey, hey President, President Obama. Obama, I'm Tim. And I'm Fred. We, we are, are twins, twins, the new trend. We're from mm -hmm. Gary, Indiana, and we're 22 years old. Man. On our YouTube channel, we listen to music for the first time we never heard before and share our thoughts. We thought we'd ask you a couple questions about music in your mm -hmm. book. What's happening, twins? I decided I'm just gonna go ahead and come here live. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what's up, man? You, you're pretty close to Chicago, right? Yeah. You down in Gary? Yeah. Listen, it's a little surprising that I just bounced in here. <laughs> you guys got some questions for me? Yeah, we noticed you talk a lot about music in your book. Can you tell us why music is so important to you? You know, I probably started listening to music seriously when I was around 10 years old. Mm. I still remember my first album uh, that I bought with my own money, which was oh. Stevie Wonder's Talking Book and Elton John's Goodbye Yellow Brick Road. So by the time I'm running for president, I'd have my own playlist that I was listening to if I was wanting to get hyped. You know, I, I had like a big debate, you know, and I'd, I'd be listening to, you know, Jay-Z or Eminem or or Frank Sinatra, just to get my mind right, or sometimes just to cool out, right? If you, you know, because there's a lot of stress, obviously. And as I sat alone in the back of the Secret Service van on the way to a debate site, in my crisp uniform and dimpled tie, I'd nod my head to the beat of those songs, feeling a whiff of private rebellion. When you were our age, did you think you would become president? You know, when I was 22, I had graduated from college, and I decided I wanted to be part of building social movements uh, around justice issues. That's how I ended up moving to Chicago. All the steel plants from Gary going into Chicago used to have tens of thousands of people working there. Suddenly, those plants started closing. Folks were losing their jobs. So there were a group of churches on the south side. These churches hired me to see if I could start organizing in some of those areas. So I drove out there. I didn't know anybody in Chicago. And in fact, I drove through Gary. And that's really how my career got started. You know, and that's how I met Michelle. Mm -hmm. What advice do you have for us as young people that's watching this now? Listen, you guys are, are living large on, on YouTube already at, at 22. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the country's so divided right now. What you guys are doing, which is being open to new ideas, new experiences, that's America at its best. And I think you guys uh, sending that message uh, is, is, is powerful. 
So keep on doing what you're doing. Um, and uh, I, I appreciate uh, you allowing me to crash your party. <laughs> and tell your folks I said hi. Okay, okay. so Be well, guys. Stay healthy. Uh, are you, too. you too. Thank you. Bye-bye. What are you, what kind of questions are you supposed to ask a president? Hey, Mr. Mama. <laughs> <laughs>